A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to Hindu Newspaper Analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 13th of February 2023. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. Without any delay, let's get into the article discussion. Today we are going to start our discussion with this front page news article. This news article reports about the appointment of governors. See yesterday our president Ms. Draupadi Murmu appointed governors for 12 states and a union territory. And out of these 13 governors appointed, 6 were new faces. And this includes the retired Supreme Court judge S. Abdul Nazir. And this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, we are going to revise about the appointment of governor in prelims perspective. See, I have taken this article today because it will be as a revision to you. Since prelims is coming nearby, you have to revise all of your static portion, okay? Now coming to the appointment of governor, first of all, which article in the constitution provides for the office of governor? Yes, it's article 153. It deals with the office of governor. It says that there shall be a governor for each state and further it provides that the same person can be appointed as governor for two or more states. So in the Indian constitution article 153 only provides for the office of governor. Remember this. Now coming to the source of the office of governor. Know that the feature of the office of governor was taken from the Government of India Act 1935. But the provision of appointment of the governor of state by the centre was borrowed from Canadian model of the government. Know this distinction, okay? The office of governor was taken from Government of India Act 1935. But the appointment procedure or the appointment provision that is the governor of the state appointed by the centre is borrowed from Canadian model. Here I have a question for you. Does Canada have a constitution like India and America? comment if you know the answer to this okay now coming back to the appointment of the governor see article 155 deals with the appointment of governor it says that the governor of a state shall be appointed by the president by warrant under his hand and seal now this is the appointment governor is appointed by president by warrant under his hand and seal now moving on to the term of office See, the term of office of governor is provided under Article 156. Now, the clause 1 of Article 156 says that the governor shall hold office during the pleasure of the president. This means that the governor will continue to serve as long as the president wishes. So, from this we can say that the governor has no security of tenure and no fixed term of office. And this is the clause 1. Now, coming to clause 2. It talks about the resignation of the governor. See, this clause provides that the governor may resign from his or her office by writing under his hand. And this resignation letter has to be addressed to the president. Now, coming to clause 3, it provides for the term of office to governor. It says that a governor shall hold office for a term of 5 years from the date on which he enters upon his office. Now, does this mean Article 156? Clause 3 provides security of tenure to the governor? Actually, no. See, in general, the governor shall hold office for 5 years as per Article 156, Clause 3. But this 5-year term is subject to the previous provision of Article 156, that is Clause 1. In Clause 1, what we saw? We saw that governor serves his office during the pleasure of the president. So, there is no security of tenure to the governor. Now, in addition to all these provisions, Article 156 further says that even after the expiration of term of 5 years, a governor shall continue to hold office until a successor enters upon the office. So, this is like a continuation of the term until the successor arrives. And these are all the provisions related to the office of governor and the appointment of governor. Now, what are all the qualifications for the office of governor? That is provided under Article 157. See, this article provides for the qualifications for appointment of governor. It says that a person to be appointed as governor should be a citizen of India. And secondly, he or she 
should have completed the age of 35 years and these are all the qualifications that is given under article 157 now finally before concluding our discussion we'll see about the oath or affirmation by the governor and this is provided under article 159 it says that every governor and every person discharging the functions of governor shall make and subscribe an oath or affirmation before entering his office and this is in the presence of chief justice of high court exercising jurisdiction in relation to the state in case of absence of chief justice of high court the senior most judge of the high court will preside over the oath of the governor now that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about office of governor from where this provision is borrowed and after that we saw about the appointment of governor tenure qualifications and finally we ended our discussion by seeing oath or affirmation by the governor now take note of all of these points and with this we shall move to the next article discussion now for our next discussion we are going to take this editorial article it talks about india us space cooperation see although there are many grounds available for cooperation there are few barriers to for a full fledged long term cooperation now in this line the article suggests few solutions to overcome these barriers for cooperation in space sector now in this discussion we'll try to understand how us and india has collaborated in the field of space research so far and we'll also see some of the important points in the article but before that i have highlighted here the syllabus relevant to this article quickly go through it now firstly we'll try to understand the indo us space cooperation from a historical perspective see indo us space cooperation has a long history america established a full fledged american space program in the year 1962 and after this India set up the equatorial rocket launching station at Tumba on the coast of Arabian Sea in 1963 and this was followed by the launch of US made Nike Apache sounding rocket in 1963 and this marked the beginning of Indian space program and later during 1975 to 1976 NASA and ISRO had conducted the satellite instrumental television experiment known as the site s i t e now under this program nasa's ats 6 satellite beamed the educational programs via television sets to over 2000 remote indian villages and since then india has been a major trading partner of the us in space technologies now during the year 1980s the us helped india to launch its own satellite telecommunication system But we all know what happened following the Pokhran nuclear test. The US imposed trade, economic and military sanctions on India. Now this sanctions hampered the progress of ISRO. Now around this time only we had a cryogenic engine contract with Russia. But America forced Russia to stop this deal as well. Besides that American agencies blocked all cooperation in the areas of supercomputing. Despite this India made remarkable progress in the field of science and technology. Now US understood that sanctions regime would not work in the Indian context. Also they could not overlook the India's record of non-proliferation. Adding to this the global geopolitics changed radically post the 9/11 twin tower incident and most importantly americans become aware of the scientific and commercial talent available in india in the areas of space technology and information technology so this is the historical background of cooperation of india and us in the space sector now with this backdrop let us see the recent progress of indo us strategic partnership See India and US are getting closer due to the changing geopolitics. So the two countries appear to be taking their space cooperation to the next level. India and the United States started engaging in space security dialogue from the year 2015 itself. See one important mission along these lines of collaboration is NISAR. N I S A R. It is expanded as NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar Mission. 
it is a joint project between nasa and isro to co develop and launch a dual frequency synthetic aperture radar on an earth observation satellite now what is this synthetic aperture radar see it is abbreviated as sar s a r it is an emerging technology in remote sensing it works similar to how bats use echolocation to navigate in a cave basically the bats create sound waves when this sound waves bounces off a wall and returns to the bat it understands the distance between the bat and the wall based on this echo the same principle only applies to sar the satellite sends microwave pulses to earth the pulse returns back to the satellite and the sensor makes an image from the returned echoes and this radar can be seen at night and through clouds and smoke as well so as i mentioned earlier the nizar is a dual frequency radar in fact nizar will be the first satellite mission to use two different radar frequencies that is the l band and the s band Now NASA is responsible for providing the mission's L band synthetic aperture radar and ISRO is providing the S band. Now what is the difference between this L band and the S band? Actually, longer wavelengths can penetrate clouds better and even the ground as well. Here, L band radar has longer wavelengths and the penetration depth is up to 25 cm and for the S band it is up to 10 cm. So this Nizar mission would measure the changes in our planet's surface. And Nizar will also be capable of observing the earth's land and ice covered surfaces on a global scale. See after this discussion kindly browse and learn about the other uses of synthetic aperture radar. It will be very useful for you. And it is also very interesting to know. I am telling you this because it is a potential prelims question okay. Now coming back to the article the article highlights some structural factors that limit the extent to which the US and India can collaborate in the field of space research it says that there is a mismatch in the interests and capabilities and these are all the barriers firstly let us see about the interest of two countries see the US has committed to returning to the moon and this time the us has committed to stay in the moon for a longer time and this is because of the different motivation drives which includes national prestige geopolitical power economic opportunity scientific knowledge etc from this we can say that us ambitions are firmly set on the moon for now although it does not fully ignore the low earth orbit but when it comes to india our scientific community focuses on building the nation's capability in and under the earth orbits this does not mean that india is not aiming for the moon mars or beyond but india's top priority for now is to substantially increase its satellite and launch capabilities in the earth orbits and this priority is to catch up with the other space faring nations such as china and this is the first barrier between us and india which is the mismatch in interests now secondly there is asymmetry in capabilities the us has the highest number of registered satellites in space it also has a range of launch vehicles serving both commercial and national security needs besides this private entity spacex for example managed to achieve a record 61 launches in the year 2022 this is the us scenario on the other hand the indian space research organization currently undertakes fewer than 10 launches each year the indian government also opened the space industry to the private sector but only in 2020 the us already has an extensive network of partners for space cooperation therefore it has a very few technical incentives to cooperate with india therefore it has very few technical incentives to cooperate with india because india is lacking the capability right see for now india and us are getting closer due to the geopolitical reasons we know china is a rival of the us and us is collaborating with us to counter china's aggressive moves but to pursue a long term cooperation there should be a proper functional incentive for the us right 
otherwise any cooperation will not be sustainable in the long run so as per the article if we could properly work through these barriers india could secure technologies and expertise by collaborating with the us and in turn the us could strengthen its relationship with india in the changing geopolitics now for this the author suggests few solutions firstly the author is suggesting that there should be a sustained engagement between academics the private sector and the state led entities in the two countries that too there should be sustained engagement in specialized projects like nazar secondly partnership between state and private entities can be one of the cooperation for instance we can make effective use of collaboration under nasa's commercial lunar payload services program that is clps program under the clps program nasa pays companies to deliver payloads to the moon now us is looking to include indian companies also in this initiative so through this india could send its astronauts to train at the american private companies and this could help india reduce its dependence on russia for training astronauts and isro can also build its own astronaut training center this is the second suggestion that is partnership between state and private entities thirdly the author is suggesting to form a consortium led by the government owned new space india limited now by this we can involve the private companies in the us in the indian space programs here note that new space india limited is a public sector undertaking of government of india and it is the commercial arm of the isro so by forming a consortium which is led by this psu we can involve private companies in the us to work in the indian space programs as we all know the main objective of the new space india limited is to scale up the private sector participation in the indian sector programs so it is very apt for fulfilling its objective also so these are all the three suggestions given by the author in this editorial first one is sustained engagement between academics private sector and state led entities in specialized projects second one is partnership between state and private entities and the third one is forming a consortium led by the new space india limited this is to increase the involvement of private companies in the us in the indian space program now before concluding the author is saying that these arrangements could accelerate india's human space flight program and this will also give the us an opportunity to accommodate indian interests in earth orbits now that's all for this editorial discussion in this discussion we saw about the cooperation of india and us in the space sector in the past and after that we saw about the nizar mission which is nasa isro synthetic aperture radar mission we understood what is synthetic aperture radar and after that we saw what are all the barriers or the structural limitations that limits the collaboration between india and us in the space research and finally we ended our discussion by seeing the author's solutions to overcome these barriers now with these points let us move on to the next article discussion now look at this snippet last monday turkey was hit by a devastating earthquake so greece foreign minister visited turkey in a show of support and this is despite a long standing rivalry between the two nato countries and this is the crux of the snippet given here so using this as an opportunity we'll try to understand the cause of rivalry between the two countries see turkey and greece they have unresolved historical issues as well as a set of post second world war disputes that still continue to disturb their relation and these include the status of cyprus access to hydrocarbon resources in the east mediterranean sea and then there is also problems with the aerial and maritime boundaries of aegean islands and the militarization of these islands but even before these issues there were some historical factors which has strained the relation between the countries see the ottoman empire conquered most of greece gradually in the 15th century so the greek war of independence broke out in 1821 and this led to the overthrowing of ottoman empire 
and Greece became the first Balkan and European nation to set free themselves from the Turks. In 1919, with the collapse of the Ottoman state, Greece attempted to conquer Western Turkey. But Greeks were defeated by the Turks and were expelled back to Greece. See, the Lausanne Treaty of 1923 was signed at the end of First World War to settle the conflict between Turkey and the allied powers including Greece. See, this treaty defined the boundaries of Turkey and Greece. Know that major territories in the Aegean Sea beyond 3 miles from the Turkish coast were ceded to Greece. And this was done with the exception of three group of islands. Now, under the terms of the Lausanne Treaty, Greece was obligated to keep the islands demilitarized. And this treaty has poured the way for the boundary issues between two countries. And this was from a historical perspective. Another cause for rivalry is the Cyprus issue. There was an ethnic rivalry between the Turkish and the Greek inhabiting the Cyprus island. In 1974, the Turkish forces landed in Cyprus and captured the island and a ceasefire was declared. And this has further increased the tensions between the two countries. Apart from this, there is also a religious side to the conflict. Turkey reconverted Hagia Sophia in Istanbul into a mosque. But know that this UNESCO World Heritage Site was originally a Byzantine church. Currently, the control of the Eastern Mediterranean and agencies for oil and gas exploration has caused tensions between the two countries. Turkey signed a deal with Libya for the creation of an exclusive economic zone from the Turkish southern coast to Libyan northeast coast. But the Greece pointed out that the agreement has failed to take Crete into account. This Greek island Crete falls midway between the Turkey and Libya. And these are all some of the causes for rivalry between the two countries. One is territorial dispute, the other one is Cyprus issue and the other one is religious issue and the final one is control of maritime territory. Now that's all for this discussion. Now with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now look at this news article, it says that evaluation by FATF is nearing. So the government agencies are taking steps to strengthen India's framework against money laundering and terrorist financing. Now this is about the news article given here. Now today in our discussion, we'll see about FATF and mutual evaluations of FATF. First of all, what is FATF? It is expanded as Financial Action Task Force and it is the Global Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing Watchdog. See, it was founded in the year 1989 on the initiative of G7. Here G7 or Group of Seven is an intergovernmental organization consisting of Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, United Kingdom and United States. Now coming back to the FATF, FATF is also an intergovernmental body. It sets up international standards that aims at preventing the illegal activities of money laundering and terrorist financing. And the other aim of the FATF is to prevent the harm caused by these activities to the society. And in addition to this, the FATF works to generate the necessary political will to bring about the national legislative and regulatory reforms in these areas. So these are all the major functions of FATF. See the Financial Action Task Force Secretariat is located at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Headquarters in Paris. Currently FATF has 39 members including two regional organizations namely the European Commission and the Gulf Cooperation Council. And know that India is also a member of FATF. Now with this information, let us see what does the FATF do. See, the FATF has developed the FATF standards. And these standards help develop a coordinated global response to prevent organized crime, corruption and terrorism. They help the authorities to go after the money which belongs to criminals dealing in illegal drugs, human trafficking and other crimes. 
See, FATF also works to stop funding for weapons of mass destruction. So, the FATF, it reviews the money laundering and terrorist financing techniques and continuously strengthens its standards to address new risks. See, the FATF, it also monitors countries to ensure that they implement the FATF standards fully and effectively. And the FATF also holds these countries, that is the member countries, accountable for these measures. Now, having gone through the basics, let us move on to see about the FATF mutual evaluations. See, these are basically reports that analyze a country's implementation and effectiveness of measures to combat money laundering and terror financing. So, it is like a report card. See, these reports are peer-reviewed which means the member countries assess the steps taken by another country to counter money laundering and terror financing. In addition to evaluating the country's anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing system, the FATF mutual evaluations also provides recommendations to augment the system. So, what does this mean? In simple words, FATF mutual evaluations means analyzing the country's implementation and effectiveness of measures. Here know that mutual evaluations not just simply evaluate the country's implementation. It also makes recommendations to improve the anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing system. Now, during a mutual evaluation, the assessed country must demonstrate that it has an effective framework to protect the financial system from abuse. Know that mutual evaluations have two main components, effectiveness and technical compliance. So, while evaluating the effectiveness, a team of experts visit the assessed country on site. During this visit, the assessment team will ask the assessed country to show evidence that the steps taken by it have been successful in combating money laundering, terror financing and proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. This is about evaluation of effectiveness. Now, the second one is evaluation of technical compliance. So, while doing this, the assessed country must provide information on laws, regulations and any other legal instruments it has in place to combat the money laundering and financing of terrorism and proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. So, while evaluating for the effectiveness, the assessed country has to provide evidence that the measures are successful and while evaluating for the technical compliance, the assessed country should provide information on laws, regulations and legal instruments of that country which it has established. Here know that I already said India is a member of FATF, right? So, the FATF mutual evaluation was also conducted for India. Now, let us see some of the key findings of it, okay? The evaluation states that India has taken some positive steps by criminalizing money laundering. Here, they are talking about Prevention of Money Laundering Act and terrorist financing. Here, they are talking about UPA Act, UAPA Act. It is nothing but the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. See, these two measures gives punishment once the crime is conducted. Apart from this, India has also taken measures to prevent the crimes from occurring by empowering the financial sector. See, all these are some positive steps taken by India, but still the conviction rate is very low. So, the FATF has advised India to take steps for the proper enforcement of anti-money laundering and anti-terror financing provisions in India. So, these are all about the mutual evaluations of India in the past. Now, according to today's article, mutual evaluation of India is going to happen again. And that's why India is making preparations for it. Now, that's all regarding this article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about FATF, its members, its functions, mutual evaluations of FATF, its significance and finally, mutual evaluation of India. Now, with these points, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, look at this article here. The news is that a prototype of air-launched unmanned aerial vehicle developed jointly by India and the US is likely to be flight tested later this year. See, in 2021, a project agreement for 
ALUAV was signed between the Indian Ministry of Defence and the US Department of Defence. And this agreement was signed under Joint Working Group Air Systems in the Defence Technology and Trade Initiative. And this is the crux of the news article given here. In this discussion, let's learn about Defence Technology and Trade Initiative. See, Defence Technology and Trade Initiative was a defence mechanism between India and the USA. It was launched in the year 2012. Know that this DTTI is neither a treaty nor a law. Whereas, it is a flexible mechanism that engages the senior leaders from both the countries to strengthen the opportunities in the field of defence. Now, what was the reason behind the creation of DTTI? See, before the creation of DTTI, the scope for cooperation in defence technology between India and the USA was very narrow. This was due to the presence of differing bureaucratic processes and legal requirements. So, DTTI was created to expedite the cooperation of defence technology between the India and the US. So, in simple words, DTTI was created to overcome the barrier of different bureaucratic process and legal requirements. Now, moving on to the aim of this initiative. The first and foremost aim is to focus on the sustained bilateral defence trade relationship between India and US. Secondly, this DTTI initiative aims to create opportunities for co-production and co-development of defence equipment. And finally, this initiative helps in exploring new areas of technological development and also expanding India-US business ties. So, these three are the main aims of DTTI. First one is to sustain the bilateral defence trade relationship. Second one is creation of opportunities for co-production and co-development. And third one is exploration of new areas of technological development and expansion of business ties. Now, let us see about the projects under DTTI. See, the projects under DTTI have been classified as near, medium and long term projects. Now, we will see them one by one. Firstly, let us take the near term projects. See, the near term projects under DTTI includes air launched small unmanned systems, lightweight small arms technology and intelligence surveillance target acquisition and reconnaissance. So, these are all the near term projects. Now, talking about the medium term projects, it includes maritime domain awareness solution, virtual augmented mixed reality for aircraft maintenance. And finally, there is this long term projects. It includes terrain shaping obstacle and the counter UAS rocket artillery and mortar systems. So, these are all the projects under DTTI. See, to execute these projects under the Defence Technology and Trade Initiative, four joint working groups focused on land, naval, air and aircraft carrier technologies have been established. And these groups promote mutually agreed projects within their domains. So, under this joint working group only, India and USA are developing this air-launched unmanned aerial vehicles. And as I said already, a project agreement for this ALUAV was signed between Indian Defence Ministry and US Department of Defence. It was signed on July 30, 2021. Now, that's all for this article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about project agreement for the air launched unmanned aerial vehicle. We saw about the defence technology and trade initiative of India and US. We saw the aims of this initiative. And after that, we moved on to see about the projects under DTTI. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing about the execution of these projects via joint working groups. Now, with these points, let's move on to the next article discussion. Now, see this article. In this article, the news is that Kerala State Human Rights Commission has registered a Suomoto case on death of tribal youth from Vayanad on Saturday. He died after being attacked by a mob at Government Medical College Hospital in Kolikod. Now, this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let's learn about State Human Rights Commission from exam perspective. Like the National Human Rights Commission, the State Human Rights Commission is also a statutory body. 
it was established in each state based on the provisions of the protection of human rights act 1993 now this is about the basis for establishment of state human rights commission now let's move on to see about the composition see the shrc consists of a chairperson and two members now what about their qualifications see as far as a chair person is concerned he or she should be a retired chief justice or retired judge of a high court and then there are two members right one member should be a serving or retired judge of high court or a district judge in the state in case of district judge he or she should have minimum of 7 years experience as district judge now for the another member he should be a person who is having knowledge or practical experience in matters relating to human rights so these are all the qualifications of chair person and two members see so know that apart from a chair person and two members the shrc also consists of a secretary who shall be the chief executive officer of the shrc the secretary exercises all administrative and financial powers of the state commission and this power is subject to the control of the chairperson of the shrc now with this information let us see about the appointment of the members of shrc see the chairperson and members shall be appointed by governor by warrant under his hand and seal know that the appointment should be made after obtaining the recommendation of a selection committee and this selection committee consists of chief minister who acts as the chairperson of the committee secondly speaker of the legislative assembly thirdly minister who is in charge of the department of home in that state and finally leader of the opposition in the legislative assembly so the selection committee consists of these members and based on the recommendation of this selection committee only governor appoints the chairperson and members of shrc here note that if there is a legislative council in a particular state then the chairperson of that council and leader of opposition in that council will also be included as members of selection committee further there is a condition here a sitting judge of the high court or a sitting district judge can be appointed only after consultation with the chief justice of high court of the concerned state and this is all about the appointment of chairperson and members of shrc now let's see about the term of office of chairperson and members see the chairperson and members hold office for a term of 3 years or until they attain the age of 70 years whichever is earlier now on ceasing to hold office the chairperson and members they are not eligible for further employment under state government or the central government so after retiring from their term they cannot be employed in any state government jobs or central government jobs however the chairperson and the members they are eligible for reappointment to the same office i hope you understand this difference you have to be very careful regarding this okay if a statement says that chairperson and members they are not eligible for reappointment to the shrc then that statement is incorrect because they are eligible for reappointment to the same office but they are not eligible for employment under any other state government or central government now this is about the term of office of chairperson and members and some conditions now let us move on to see about the removal procedure as we saw earlier the chairperson and members of the state human rights commission are appointed by the governor right now here comes the golden question are they removed by the governor no see they can be removed only by the president see president can remove them on the grounds and in the same manner as he can remove the chairperson or member of a national human rights commission so the procedure for removal is same for shrc and nhrc in addition to these the president can also remove the chairperson or a member on grounds of proved misbehavior or incapacity however in these cases president has to refer the matter to the supreme court for an enquiry if the supreme court after the enquiry upholds the cause of removal and advises the same then the president can remove the chairperson or a member so these are the two scenarios about the removal of members of shrc here i told you that the removal procedure for the members of shrc is equal to the nhrc right 
So go and read about the removal procedure for the members of NHRC. See, like this only you have to study. Your preparation has to be an integrated one. Then only you will be able to easily remember the points in your examination hall. Now coming back, let us conclude our discussion by seeing the jurisdiction of State Human Rights Commission. Okay. See, the State Human Rights Commission can enquire into the violation of human rights only in respect of subjects mentioned in the state list and the concurrent list. We all know the state list, concurrent list and the union list, they constitute the seventh schedule of the constitution, right? So, the jurisdiction of SHRC is limited to state list and concurrent list in the seventh schedule. However, if any such case is already being enquired by the NHRC or any other statutory commission, then the State Human Rights Commission does not enquire into that case. Now, how is this possible? We saw that SHRC's jurisdiction includes concurrent list, right? Think about it, no? Concurrent list means NHRC also has jurisdiction over it, right? So, if NHRC is inquiring about any case that comes under concurrent list, then that case will not be inquired by the SHRC. Now, that's all regarding the jurisdiction of State Human Rights Commission. And with this, we have also come to the end of this particular article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the establishment of State Human Rights Commission, its composition, qualification of members of State Human Rights Commission, appointment, selection committee, the term of office of chairperson and members, the removal procedure and finally the jurisdiction of State Human Rights Commission. Now with these points, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now for our next discussion, we are going to take this text and context article. This text and context article talks about micro LED display technology. See Apple is currently working on this new display technology and it plans to implement them on future watch models from 2024. And once implemented, it will be gradually introduced to its other devices including iPhones and Macs. However, the article says that the complications and challenges associated with the new technology may cause Apple's plans to be delayed. See, this is what is given in this article here. In this context, we are going to understand what is this micro LED technology and why it is preferred by Apple. See, before getting into the discussion, you have to understand what is LED and what is LCD. See, both are display technologies. See, when it comes to display technology, LCD stands for liquid crystal display and it is a passive device that employs fluorescent bulbs to brighten the image. Here, passive means not influencing or changing the situation. So here the work is done by the fluorescent bulbs because that only brightens the image. On the other hand, LED, it is a form of LCD. LED stands for light emitting diode. See, it is a semiconductor device that emits light when current flows through it. And it uses a different kind of backlight technology to brighten the image. Here, the similarity between the two is that both uses liquid crystal display. So, what is this liquid crystal display? We all know that there are three states of matter, right? Solids, liquids and gases. But there are some substances that are actually a strange blend of different states. Likewise, a liquid crystal is a state of matter between liquid and solid. In simple words, they change shape like a liquid, but they have the molecular alignment characteristics of a solid crystal. And that is exactly why they are called as liquid crystal. Now, these liquid crystals, they are only in charge of electronically turning a filter on and off to keep that pixel black or to reveal a specific color. So, from this, what do we understand? We understand that both LCD and LED monitors, they use liquid crystals only. But the difference is that they use different backlighting. We saw that in case of LCD, fluorescent bulbs brighten the image, right? In case of LED, it uses a semiconductor device which emits light when current flows through it. So it is the backlighting that really makes them different from one another. 
you all know what is backlight right it is a form of illumination from the back side of the screen like i already said standard lcd monitors they employ fluorescent lamps as backlights and these fluorescent lights are evenly placed behind the screen so that they deliver consistent lighting across the display and all regions of the picture will have similar brightness level now led monitors they do not use fluorescent lamps instead they use light emitting diodes which are extremely small lights and these provide crisper image when compared to lcd now these are few basic points that you have to know about lcd and led now let us come to micro led technology see it is an emerging flat panel display technology consisting of arrays of microscopic leds forming the individual pixel elements i hope you all know what are pixels right pixels are the basic building blocks of a digital image a pixel is a small dot that can emit colored light it works like a mosaic but each individual piece is much less noticeable remember every pixel is composed of three color filters which are called as sub pixels there is a red blue and green sub pixel for every pixel so an array of microscopic leds forms an individual pixel element here array represents collection of items okay so a collection of microscopic leds forms individual pixel element as we saw individual pixel element has three color filters namely red blue and green sub pixel and this arrangement only forms the micro led technology now another specialty of micro led is that they are self emissive in nature this means that every sub pixel is a tiny light source that can be individually controlled what is a sub pixel here it is the red blue green filters so these sub pixels they are tiny light source and they can be individually controlled so in the micro led panels the emissive electroluminescent layer itself is a film of inorganic compounds that emits light in response to an electric current in simple words they do not require separate backlighting this means the layer itself will emit light when electric current is passed through it see that's all you have to understand don't bother about the big big technical words and all they are self emissive and they do not require separate backlighting if you still cannot understand what i'm saying just try to grasp this idea see lcd based displays get white light from a backlight and this light passes through lcd pixels and then through a color filter which allows us to see the colored image but this micro leds they are self emissive in nature they do not require a backlight instead the panel layer itself is a film of inorganic compound which emits light when electric current is passed through it and we already saw every sub pixel is a tiny light source and it can be individually controlled and this is only the array of micro leds and the picture in a micro led screen is generated by several individual light emitting diodes i hope now you got the clarity see because of this advantage only micro leds have several benefits over other displays now let us see them one by one firstly micro led displays are brighter they have better color reproduction and they provide better viewing angles and they make images appear as if they painted on the top of the device's glass see that much clear the image will be and this is the first advantage secondly since micro leds are resolution free bezel free ratio free and even size free they have limitless scalability this means that they have the capacity to be changed in size or scale and the screen can be freely resized in any form for practical usage and thirdly since they are made up of inorganic compounds micro led promises even greater luminance without panel degradation issues so these are all some of the advantages of the micro led technology but according to the article know that there are some issues like high cost and technical challenges 
So, developing Apple's own micro LED display might take some time until 2025. Now, that's all for this article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about LCD, it's working, LED and it's working and we saw micro LED technology, its characteristics and finally, we ended our discussion by seeing the advantages of micro LED technology. Now, with these points, let us move on to the next article discussion. See, this article is the final article for our discussion today. This article says that the resignation letter of independent India's first law minister, B.R. Ambedkar, is missing from the official records. Despite extensive search in the constitutional affairs section, the document could not be located. This is a serious issue, right? But we are not going to concentrate about that today. Instead, using this opportunity, we are going to quickly brush up the facts about Ambedkar and some of the contributions of him. See, Bhima Rao Ambedkar was born to Bhima Bai and Ramji on 14th April 1891. He was born in Central Provinces, Madhya Pradesh. This is some of the basics about Bhima Rao Ambedkar's personal life. See, we are not going to see much more of it. Now, we are going to concentrate on the social contributions of Ambedkar. See, Ambedkar had devoted his life to remove untouchability. He believed that the progress of the nation would not be realized without the removal of untouchability. He also worked for the abolition of caste system in entire society. He studied Hindu philosophical traditions and made a critical assessment of the caste system. For him, untouchability is a kind of slavery. See, untouchables, they were enslaved by caste Hindus and the caste Hindus themselves live under slavery of religious sculptures. So, the emancipation of the untouchables leads to the emancipation of whole Hindu society. So, he said that untouchability is the slavery of entire Hindu society. And this is his stand regarding untouchability. Now, moving on. In 1920, Ambedkar launched a newspaper called Mook Nayaka, which means leader of the silent. And he launched this newspaper with the assistance of Shahaji II, the Maharaja of Kolhapur. Other periodicals include Bahishkrit Bharat, Samata, Janata. In 1923, he set up the Bahishkrit Hitkarani Sabha, which means Outcasts Welfare Association, which was devoted to spreading education and culture amongst the downtrodden. Apart from this, he launched full-fledged movements for Dalit rights by 1927 and demanded public drinking water sources open to all and right for all castes to enter temples. See, the temple entry movement launched by Dr. Ambedkar in 1930 at Kalaram Temple, Nashik, is another landmark in the struggle for human rights and social justice. And I hope you can all recall about the signing of Pune Pact. See, back in 1919, in his testimony before the South Borough Committee in the preparation of Government of India Act, Ambedkar opined that there should be a separate electoral system for the untouchables and other marginalized communities. And later in 1932, Gandhiji protested the communal award of a separate electorate by fasting. And Gandhiji fasted while he was in the Eravada Central Jail of Pune. And this resulted in the Pune Pact. So, after the Pune Pact, Gandhiji ended his fast and Ambedkar dropped his demand for a separate electorate. Instead, a certain number of seats were reserved specifically for the depressed classes. And this is what is Pune Pact. And these are all some of the social contributions of Ambedkar. Now, let us move on to see about the political contribution. See, Dr. Ambedkar attended all the three roundtable conferences in London. And each time, he forcefully projected his views in the interest of untouchables. In the year 1936, he founded the Independent Labour Party and his party contested the 1937 elections to the Central Legislative Assembly. And later in 1942, he founded the Scheduled Castes Federation as well. Apart from all these, in 1947, Dr. Ambedkar was appointed as the Chairman of Constitution Drafting Committee 
where he got an opportunity to express all his opinions he laid emphasis on constitutional morality which is still binding us in the form of constitution in his perspective constitutional morality means effective coordination between conflicting interest of different people and administrative cooperation now that's all for this article discussion in this discussion we saw about the social and political contributions of ambedkar now with these points in mind let us move on to the next part of the discussion that is the practice prelims question discussion today we have six prelims questions i will solve five of them and as usual one of them is a quiz question for you now let us take this first question with reference to the appointment of governor in india consider the following statements statement 1 the constitution of india provides that the governor should be an outsider and he should not belong to the state where he is appointed statement 2 as a convention the president consults the chief minister of the concerned state while appointing the governor see here in these two statements statement 1 is incorrect and statement 2 is correct let me explain it to you the constitution of india does not provide for the provisions that we saw in these two statements both are convention okay see two conventions were developed in appointing governor over the years the first convention is that the governor should be an outsider and he should not belong to the state where he is appointed and this is being done to ensure that the governor should be free from the local politics and then the second convention is that while appointing the governor the president consults the chief minister of the state concerned and this is to ensure smooth functioning of the constitutional machinery in the state however both the conventions have been violated in many cases so like i said the provisions given in these two statements are convention there is no such provision in the constitution so statement 1 is incorrect and statement 2 is correct so the correct answer to this question is option b 2 only now moving on to the second question the mediterranean sea is bordered by which of the following countries turkey greece syria israel libya see 21 countries have coast lines on the mediterranean sea they are albania algeria Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Cyprus, Egypt, France, Greece, Israel, Italy, Lebanon, Libya, Malta, Monaco, Montenegro, Morocco, Slovenia, Spain, Syria, Tunisia and Turkey. So exactly 21 countries have coastlines on the Mediterranean Sea. Now look at the statements All of these countries have border with the Mediterranean Sea. So the correct answer to this question is option D, 1 2 3 4 and 5. Moving on to the third question, consider the following statements about various lists of FATF. Statement 1, the countries that are considered to be safe haven for supporting terror funding and money laundering are put in the FATF grey list. Statement 2, Black list is a list of countries that the Financial Action Task Force considers non-cooperative in the global effort to combat money laundering and financing of terrorism. Statement 3, a black listed country may be subject to economic sanctions by a member of FATF. See in this question all of the statements are correct. Go through the statements again and take note of it, okay? And also know that currently Democratic People's Republic of Korea that is North Korea Iran and Myanmar they are placed in the black list and recently Pakistan was removed from the grey list now moving on to the fourth question with reference to the defense technology and trade initiative consider the following statements statement 1 it is a defense mechanism between india and russia which strives to strengthen the opportunities in the field of defense see the statement is incorrect We know that Defence Technology and Trade Initiative is a mechanism between India and the US. It was launched in 2012 and it engages senior leaders from both the countries to strengthen opportunities in the field of defence. Now statement 2, this initiative aims to create opportunities for co-production and co-development of defence equipment. Now this statement is correct. This we saw in our discussion itself. So the correct answer to this question is option B to only. Now moving on to the fifth question with reference to 
State Human Rights Commission consider the following statements. Statement 1. It is a statutory body established in states under the Protection of Civil Rights Act 1955. The statement is incorrect. It is a statutory body. That is correct. But it was established under Protection of Human Rights Act 1993. Now, statement 2, it can inquire into the violation of human rights only on subjects mentioned in the state list of the 7th schedule of constitution. See, this statement is also incorrect because SHRC has powers to inquire into the violation of human rights on subjects in state list as well as the concurrent list. Now, moving on to the third statement, the recommendations of the commission are binding on the government. Again, this statement is also incorrect. The recommendations of the SHRC are not binding on the government. Look carefully what has the question asked. The question has also asked for the incorrect statements. We found that all of the three statements are incorrect. So the correct answer to this question is option D1213. Now moving on to the final question. See aspirants, this is only the quiz question for you. Read the question carefully, think about it and post your answer in the comment section. Aspirants, I have displayed here the mains practice questions. So, interested people, write it and post your answer in the comment section. If you have any queries related to the articles that we discussed today, post that also in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end. If you find the video useful, like, share and comment and do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy's YouTube channel for further updates. Thank you.